не знаю, что здесь происходит в отсутствии человека. Но стоит тут появиться людям, как все здесь приходит в движение. Это зона. Imagine the following scenario. You, the player, are tasked with stealing top secret documents from a former research institute turned military complex swarming with enemies. You manage to slip into the main building undetected, narrowly avoiding the eyesight of your adversaries. But just as you reach the target, you are spotted and the alarm goes off. Undeterred, you reload your previous save with the intention of making the alert go away, only to be confronted with the same relentless wailing you load the next save in your list, and once again, the haunting sound is still there. It's as if the ghost of your previous inept incarnation has polluted your world with its spectral presence, and there's nothing you can do about it. This scene epitomizes the often baffling, yet thoroughly fascinating series of first-person shooter survival horror games developed by GSC Game World, Stalker. Stalker is not a series of finished products, but rather a work in progress a palimpsest whose texture inscribes the history of its troubled development. All the hardships, discarded ideas, and unrealistic ambitions that dog the game's development haunt them in the form of innumerable bugs and frustrating design flaws. And yet, despite, or perhaps even because of these faults, the series managed to attract a sizable cult following, spawning an abundance of mods, fan fiction, novels, as well as films, and even inspired courageous fans to enact their fantasies in the game's real-life setting. The Chernobyl Exclusion Zone. The story of the Stalker series illustrates that sometimes success is only possible if it straddles the border of disaster. The history of Stalker starts in the latter half of 2001, when GSC Game World, a small game development studio based in Kiev, Ukraine, announced a futuristic first-person shooter in which you would journey alongside an elite task force assigned with traveling through interplanetary portals to unknown worlds and clearing out a path for future colonizers. Cryptically titled Oblivion Lost, the game promised fantastical locales to explore, such as verdant valleys containing Aztec pyramids and robot dinosaurs. However, the game's story alone would not carry it. After Doom, System Shock, Heretic, Quake, and Half-Life, Gamers' interest in yet another science fiction shooter steeped in occult symbolism, mutated and mechanized creatures, messages written in blood, and grotesque netherworlds of the Lovecraftian vein had worn thin. Luckily, GSC had more to offer. Oblivion Lost would be a showcase for the power of the X-Ray graphics engine, a state-of-the-art video game piece of technology that GSC had been gestating since the year 2000, capable of creating and sustaining environments with far more realism than prior games in the genre. In addition, unlike the aforementioned games, which confine the player to labyrinthine and mostly closed spaces, Oblivion Lost would unfold across an immense open environment, with local flora rendered in minute detail and fauna simulated using GSC's advanced artificial intelligence system. However, before long, GSC came to realize that a monumental interplanetary space opera with a plethora of different universes was not only somewhat cliché, but also far too ambitious for the studio's small size and at odds with the X-Ray engine's strongest suit, creating realistic environments. Instead of using it to construct fictional alien planets, why not use it to recreate locations from the real world? The team had already been considering using their technology to make a game based on Roadside Picnic a science fiction novel in which daring thieves known as stalkers scavenge for artifacts in strange zones on Earth created by an extraterrestrial visitation. While Oblivion Lost's ambitious interdimensional plot would ultimately be abandoned in favor of Roadside Picnic, when one reviews GSC's prior works, it is apparent that the Skodowski Brothers novel was the right pick as the thematic basis for what the project would become. From Warcraft 2000, Nuclear Epidemic, a post-apocalyptic mod of Blizzard's seminal work in which aliens have granted the citizens of Azeroth nuclear weapons, to Kosox, a real-time strategy game evoking the rebellious, cowboy-esque communities of Eastern Europe of the same name. 
to codename Outbreak, a tactical shooter set in a zone contaminated with a parasitic alien life form that takes control of its host minds. GSE's prior releases all possess a deep-rooted fascination with isolated or contested no-man's lands penetrated by invasive yet ambiguous presences, be it human, biological, or radioactive. This genetic lineage, combined with the immediacy of the first-person perspective and the power of the X-ray engine to imbue environments with a sense of ghostly uncanniness, made a strong case for the potential of a first-person shooter based on Roadside Picnic. If only GSC could find the right place to have it set. <laughs> Initially, the studio wanted the game set in Crimea, with the site of the unfinished Crimean Atomic Energy Station as the center of the zone. The developers thought this region would provide a perfect arena for a video game, with mountains acting as natural barriers and varied biomes such as the Valley of Ghosts and the Chernurachensky Canyon providing picturesque vistas for the player to explore. However, Sergei Grigorovich, GSC's founder, came up with the idea of making a game about the existing Chernobyl Exclusion Zone. Although some members of the team had moral objections against setting the game at the site of what was a relatively recent tragedy, the allure of Chernobyl, as both a harrowing locale in which the ghostly presence of radiation had weaved itself into the texture of a familiar world, and an internationally recognized real-world location that had haunted people's imaginations worldwide since the 1980s, convinced the team that it would be the right choice as the game's location. And so, Stalker, using an abbreviated style title in order to avoid copyright violation from Andrei Tarkovsky's science fiction film of the same name, began to take shape. International publishers would begin to take interest in the project. In 2003, it was announced that THQ, looking to appeal to the hardcore gamer demographic, would be publishing the game, and that the game would see release in the second quarter of 2004. THQ also recommended that GSC retitle the game from Stalker Oblivion Lost to Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl. In 2004, it was announced that the game was delayed to the following year. While the primary reason given for the postponement was to improve Stalker's graphical fidelity, Behind the scenes at GSC, there was another, far more serious cause for the game's delay. In many ways, the development of Stalker had thus far been a success. GSC had managed to create an outstanding simulation of an open environment with a dynamic ecosystem, driven by A-Life, an artificial intelligence system which enabled the game's world to run without the player's participation. Non-playable characters would go their own ways, complete their own quests, and even finish the game before the player did. All the same, the world remained highly conducive to the player's actions, with the player able to seamlessly traverse it in vehicles or on foot, and free to set their own objectives as they pleased. There was just one small problem. It did not make for a good game. Rather than give players well-defined tasks to complete, the game, in its current form, risked leading players to wander aimlessly or outright lose the game because a non-playable character had beaten them to a crucial objective. GSC realized that Regardless of how intricate their artificial intelligence system was, games are about the player's experience, and theirs was not. After several years of development, Stalker, yet again, had to be reworked. In February of 2005, the game was indefinitely postponed with the implication-laden iconic expression, when it's done. While such an expression could have represented the title's death knell, GSC apparently managed to completely reshape Stalker into a sellable product reworking its core systems to be more accommodating to the player's enjoyment before the end of the year. However, just as a serious surgery requires extensive recuperation, the developer's extensive reworking of the game resulted in an abundance of bugs and other issues, preventing the team from releasing it right away. The next year would be mainly devoted to attempting to fix these bugs, upgrading the X-Ray engine to DirectX 9, and optimizing, testing, and promoting the game. During this time, several members of the team a few of which had been involved with Stalker since its beginning, would depart GSC to conceive the Metro first-person shooter series as 4A games. Despite sharing the same genre and a similar post-apocalyptic thematic, 
The Metro series design philosophy is practically the inverse of that of Stalker's, taking place almost entirely within underground tunnels beneath the ruins of Moscow, and possessing, appropriately, a far more linear and tightly structured campaign. Regardless, these departures from GSC were not enough to disrupt the Prime Studio's efforts to finish Stalker. In March of 2007, Stalker, Shadow of Chernobyl, would finally be released after over half a decade of development. For both outside members of the video game industry and fans alike, Stalker's release was something of a surprise, as the game's repeated delays suggested the title was on the verge of becoming vaporware. For GSC, Stalker's release could only have been alleviating. Five years ago, GSC not only managed to create an outstanding engine, but made the decision to back it up with a masterstroke of an idea. In a time when most shooters provided escape to distant worlds, they decided to set their game in a real place fraught with connotations and capitalize on the cultural value of their project. But in the midst of the process of creating their dream game, they failed to consider whether their revolutionary undertaking would actually make for an enjoyable experience, forcing them back to the drawing board to turn the title into an entertaining product to play, and then attempting to debug all the problems this reparation created. Stalker's development was severely troubled, and despite GSC's best efforts, this would show once consumers finally got their hands on the product and discovered it to still be laden with many bugs, technical hiccups, and questionable gameplay design. But it was not enough to halt its development or consumers' appreciation of the title's merits once it was released. While the game's original title, Oblivion Lost, doesn't make much sense in any context, Oblivion was most definitely avoided during the title's troubled development. Well, let's leave this place, pal. Let's have some dinner. I know that you're more interested in that than our old friend. Stalker, Shadow of Chernobyl is effectively a multi-layered ghost story, the most prominent ghost being the game's protagonist, the Marked One. The player first encounters the Marked One in a death truck, a Sharon's fairy of the Industrial Age, carrying the rotting flesh of the dead for unknown reasons to an unknown destination and by an unknown driver. The heathen machine is struck by a punitive bolt of lightning and our protagonist miraculously rises from the ashes or rather, is found by a stalker scavenging for loot and brought to a local merchant named Sidorovich. A conveyor of secular wisdom, Sidorovich introduces the player to their current location, the Zone, a twisted approximation of the Chernobyl exclusion zone teeming with mutated enemies and seemingly supernatural phenomena and provides them with enough basic knowledge to help them survive. As the player progresses in the game, they discover that their avatar, the Marked One, has lost his memory and the only thing that anchors him to this realm is the command to kill the enigmatic Straylock recorded on his PDA. Like the ghost of Hamlet's father, the Marked One is only kept in the limbo of this world by the will of someone's death. However, with no knowledge as to who Straylock is, or why someone has ordered the protagonist to kill him, there is no wish for revenge. He's simultaneously just another ghostly presence, and yet the only vestige of the player's identity. As the player progresses through the game, ghosts of all forms pervade the experience, be it specters of radiation, of mind control, of the departed in the form of recorded messages, or of the zone's past, buried in unreachable places. At some points in the experience, the world turns almost monochromatic, as if the protagonist himself is becoming a shadow in a faded sepia photograph. While such an interpretation of Stalker's world may seem superfluous, it is actually required in order to understand the game's sense of atmosphere for which many have praised the game. For Stalker's game world is atmospheric not because it is realistic in terms of its depiction of its geographical location and culture, but because on all levels, including the game's plot, the Chernobyl exclusion zone is framed as a limbo, a place separate from this world. On the contrary, the real Chernobyl that the game is based on is set in both local and global contexts. The actual incident, the Chernobyl disaster in 1986, not only impacted those who lived or worked in the vicinity of the disaster and lost their land, health, and even lives to the radiation, but also had major economic and environmental repercussions at national and global levels. Similarly, some players extended the idea of cultural conditioning to the game's technical aspects, assuming, or sometimes even stating outright, that the game was intentionally difficult and broken so as to reflect on the reality of life in Eastern Europe. While other critics interpreted vestiges of the original form of the project, such as events activated automatically within the game's world that the player could choose not to participate in, and even beat the game without the player's input, as being an expression of Ukrainian culture based on a deeply rooted association of Eastern Europe with an oversimplified idea of communism. That Stalker, 
unlike some Western games based on capitalistic egocentrism and fantasies of empowerment, is supposed to be a manifestation of an ideology in which the individual is just a cog in an overwhelming state machine that cares little for the individual. Despite the fact that these mechanisms and technical issues, which are implicitly perceived as a cultural issue in Ukraine, wouldn't raise an eyebrow if present in a Western game. Death would have saved you from the dreams. Though the game's plot may seem enticing, many technical issues hamper its presentation, some of them likely caused by GSC's reworking of the game halfway through its development. In addition, many crucial pieces of information about the game's story are tied to optional quests, meaning players that do not go out of their way to experience the full breadth of what Stalker has to offer will likely come away disappointed at the lack of answers the game's main story provides. That is, provided the player is resilient enough to remain interested in the plot, as most of it is conveyed in interminable dialogues. Perhaps even more frustrating is the game's decision to feature English dialogue spoken with fake Russian accents, a decision meant to add to the game's local flavor, but many perceived as irritating and unnecessary in practice. Men, Wolf here sent us some support along with the order to attack. Time to move on and be here. When it comes to the game's locale, the zone is brimming with anomalies, artifacts, and mutants after a mysterious explosion in 2006, an event which not only transformed the location in question, but gave the game's developers the poetic license to reshape it as they desired. And this shape is a compromise between GSC's initial open-world ambitions and their latter reworking of the game. The player has the freedom of movement, but only within confined, albeit large areas, separated by loading zones. The player begins in the game's southernmost part, a rural settlement containing ruined houses, mills, and barns. Thereafter, the player travels to a junkyard containing radioactive scrap dumped there after the plant's incident. The power plant itself, scientific and military complexes, industrial areas, a swamp, some underground mazes, and finally, the town of Pripyat, the latter of which contains some iconic scenery that the player will likely miss as they attempt to scrape their way through to the game's final showdown, bereft of supplies and surrounded by enemies. Ultimately, while each of the zone's thematic areas are separate from one another, they are nonetheless tied together through the light motifs of the zone's encroaching nature, as well as the peeling paint, broken tiles, rust, and decaying concrete represented of shattered industrial and scientific dreams. In terms of gameplay, Stalker features a mixture of both first-person shooter and RPG elements. The player has an inventory to manage, side quests to complete, and the opportunity to roam about in search of items without worry of needing to constantly complete any pressing objectives. While Stalker's mechanics attempt to emulate a feeling of realism with regards to the player's continuous survival in the game's treacherous landscape, certain mechanisms end up leading to frustrating situations for the player, breaking the game's immersion. For instance, much like Bethesda's Fallout and Elder Scrolls series, the game utilizes a weight system that keeps track of the heaviness of the current objects in the player's inventory. While a potentially immersive mechanic in theory, in practice the weight system ends up being an absurd balancing act in which the player constantly attempts to stay just within the game's allotted weight limit, as once they pass it, they instantly become unable to move. Regardless, Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl is still an achievement. It's a solid shooter with a plausible world, an appealing design aesthetic, and, were it not for its presentation issues, a befitting plot. However, as a result of its themes and place of origin, it is also a game that sometimes gets mythologized out of proportion, leading to cultural misapprehensions as to what the game is attempting to communicate to the player. Shadow of Chernobyl is not an accurate representation of a real place, nor is it challenging and broken as a means of symbolizing how challenging and broken life is in Eastern Europe. Rather, Stalker's roughness stems from the tumultuous development process that led to its creation. In actual fact, we have nothing to worry about. According to our research, the next emission will not occur for at least two months, four days, and seven hours. Its intensity will be three on the Bergman scale, which is 2.13. Over a year after the release of Stalker, Shadow of Chernobyl, GSC would release a prequel in 2008 titled Stalker, Clear Sky. Clear Sky features the same engine and most of the same locations as its predecessor, with new areas including the Great Swamp, where the eponymous Clear Sky Group is located, and Limansk, a secret research city based on Chernobyl II, a secretive radar station. 
considering how much of Clear Sky's world borrows from Shadow of Chernobyl, and that a good portion of the game's new content was originally intended to be included in the original game, Clear Sky is better described less as a completely new experience, and more as an iteration of Chernobyl, another try at the same ongoing project begun with its predecessor. Clear Sky's story also begins with an unlikely resurrection. The game's protagonist, a mercenary called Scar, awakens from an energy explosion unscathed and in the headquarters of the game's eponymous organization. While the Clear Sky organization is at first presented as a rational body, interested solely in learning about the nature of the zone, it is soon revealed that the group's science is based on the curious, animistic premise that the zone is like a living organism and that the energy it emits are effectively immune responses to intruders attempting to penetrate its center. The player, a medium attuned especially to the nature of the zone, must track down and kill these intruders so as to prevent them from plucking a metaphorical forbidden fruit of ultimate knowledge. Clear Sky's gameplay is largely identical to that of its predecessors, containing many of the same strengths and grievances. One significant change, however, highlights GSC's efforts to try and approach the ideal they'd planned from the very beginning of Stalker's development, the game's faction wars. Rather than remain unaffiliated with the groups within Stalker's universe, Clear Sky allows players to directly experience ideas implicit in Shadow of Chernobyl by siding with the game's various groups and help them conquer or defend occupied areas against enemy factions. In addition to adding a new layer of complexity to the game's mechanics, the faction wars provide significance to places which originally served only as backdrops for Shadow of Chernobyl's action and help pique the player's interest in the zone's political situation. Unfortunately, GSC's execution of the Faction Wars system is far from perfect, with much what the player can do within the system remaining a gimmick rather than an impactful core mechanism of the game. All the same, its inclusion shows GSC's commitment to try and grasp the original core of their first project, like the Stalker searching for the center of the zone, without fundamentally overhauling or abandoning its design. The last official entry in the series, Stalker, Call of Pripyat, would release in Europe in the fall of 2009 and English-speaking markets in 2010. While the title's core mechanics remains once again virtually the same as its predecessors, the title is far less buggy, thanks to a better optimized engine and more resources spent debugging the title prior to release, and contains a number of design changes that together, for better or for worse, make for a somewhat different experience than what was offered in Shadow of Chernobyl or Clear Sky. Taking place after the events of Shadow of Chernobyl, Paul of Pripyat casts the player as Major Alexander Dekyadov, an ex-stalker and member of Ukraine's security agency sent to investigate the crash site of several military helicopters near the center of the zone. The game's world consists of three large areas close to the zone's center, made available by the efforts of the original game's protagonist. The investigative nature of the game's plot, connected with the fact that Alexander is on friendly terms with both stalkers and the military, allows for a less linear experience, as the player is given a larger incentive to thoroughly explore the game's areas and contends with fewer enemies attempting to kill them when traveling from one place to another. Side quests have a more complex structure, plot twists and narrative choices feature more heavily than in its predecessors, and the player is finally able to easily explore the eponymous city of Pripyat which, as previously explained, had been far more difficult to do in Shadow of Chernobyl. With Call of Pripyat, GSC attempted to reach for their initial ideal of an unfettered open-world simulation by, almost paradoxically, strongly narrativizing many of the game's environments. GSC clearly understood that most players would not explore areas of their games unless they have a strong reason for doing so. But whereas the reason provided by Clear Sky was the prospect of conflict and of owning spaces within the zone, Call of Pripyat by asking a more sophisticated question about its spaces, what happened here? Ushered in more narrative diversity into its locales than was previously possible, and in doing so, provided a more compelling reason to motivate players' exploration of them. However, as a result of this narrativization and of the game's fewer enemy combatants, Call of Pripyat features a notably lesser emphasis on combat and survival than Shadow of Chernobyl or Clear Sky. While this does not make Call of Pripyat an inherently lesser experience than the series' other games, it does result in Call of Pripyat feeling at odds with the DNA of its predecessors and their emphasis on contested no-man's lands penetrated by invasive and dangerous presences. Overall, 
If there exists a single dominating theme throughout the lifespan of the three officially published Stalker games, it's the uneasy split between the series' initial concept of an open-world real-time simulation and the demands of the market. Shadow of Chernobyl featured relatively open spaces, but provided little reason to explore them, making it easy for the game to transform into a linear shooter governed by its main plot. Clear Sky tried to amend this situation with its Faction Wars mechanism, but to mixed success. Call of Pripyat chose to go the way of narrativizing its spaces to give them significance. However, this came at the expense of the series' shooting and survival mechanisms. The life cycle of the Stalker series, from beginning to end, was a continuous struggle on the part of the developers to figure out how to bridge the chasm between open-world hyper-realism and player motivation that cracked open during development of the first game. Unfortunately, GSC would never get the opportunity to resolve these two halves with a proper sequel. In August 2010, GSC would announce Stalker 2. Originally intended to run on a new cross-platform engine created by GSC itself, Stalker 2 would have done away with the series' segmented areas to allow for a seamless traversal of its world continuing the story of its prior three entries within the most realistic depiction of the zone to date. Unfortunately, issues would begin to surface the following year, when it was reported that GSC was compounded by financial troubles and that CEO Sergei Grigorovich was dissatisfied with the direction that the sequel was taking. While the exact nature of Sergei's issues with Stalker 2 have never been firmly established, they would nonetheless tangibly manifest themselves in December of 2011 when Sergei would make the unexpected decision to cancel Stalker 2 and close GSC Game World entirely. In response, Stalker 2's remaining staff would attempt to band together and scout outside investors to fund the continued development of Stalker 2 without Sergei, only to be further compromised by Sergei's own interest in continuing the Stalker license on his own terms. In April of 2012, unwilling to end development on the fabled sequel despite having not been paid since December, yet unable to reach an agreement with the franchise's IP owner, GSC would announce the cancellation of Stalker 2. In the immediate aftermath of Stalker 2's closing, much of the title's development team would leave GSC to develop Servarium as Vostuk Games. Released on Steam Early Access in 2015, Servarium would attempt to continue its predecessor's obsession with post-apocalyptic survival and contested spaces in the midst of an ambiguous ecological disaster within the mold of a multiplayer free-to-play online first-person shooter. Meanwhile, after over two years of silence, GSC Game World would unexpectedly announce its return in December of 2014. Composed of a mix of both newer and older talent, the newly revived GSC would express its interest in making games based on the studio's older properties, with the intention of appealing to the studio's more mature fans. In 2016, almost seven years after the release of Call of Pripyat, GSC would release Cossacks 3 a remake of the first title in their real-time strategy series to mixed reviews. While it is impossible to know exactly how Stalker 2's story would have unfolded, information available online suggests that the title would have cast players in the role of an ex-Stalker who, suffering from strange visions, visits Straylock in search of advice. Straylock tells him to visit the Doctor, another character from Shadow of Chernobyl. However, after the protagonist leaves, Straylock's office is destroyed by a mysterious explosion. Accused of murder, the protagonist is incarcerated, only to be freed by an unknown stalker who flees with him into the depths of the zone. Would Stalker 2 have been the stalker? The ideal game GSC intended to make since the beginning of this millennium? we may never know. The phenomenon that is the Stalker franchise, however, continues to live on. The series modding community continues to improve and iterate upon Stalker, with some even striving to completely recreate the original game, while ambitious fans attempt to translate Stalker's appeal to the medium of film, making up for the unfulfilled promise of a Stalker television series teased by GSC in 2010. Moreover, Stalker's place in the discourse of games remains secure, with many writers to this day discussing the series' merits and lamenting the franchise's premature end. But why do people continue to discuss, iterate, and pour their time and love into this franchise, despite its imperfections? Certainly much of Stalker's appeal stems from its novel, real-life setting, and the ghostly atmosphere it provides. But more than that, 
Stalker managed to cultivate the die-hard community it possesses today through its undying promise of an unfettered open world in which non-playable characters dynamically interact with each other without the player's participation. A divine ideal which the game's creators, in the process of making Shadow of Chernobyl, were severed from, but which nonetheless managed to remain buried deep within the code of the series' released games. Much like how the stalkers are drawn to the zone in hopes of discovering otherworldly treasures, fans all over the world still explore the remains of GSC's lost paradise with the hope of finding this mythical experience at its center. I don't know whether I was right or wrong. I guess I'll never know. But I made it. And I guess I should be thankful for that. We hope you enjoyed our Stalker Retrospective. Videos such as these are made possible by the support of our viewers. If you enjoy our content, please consider subscribing if you haven't already and becoming a patron to help us make more.